Welcome to season three of Diabetes Health Matters. I'm going to say it again because it's so wonderful. Yes, welcome to season three of Diabetes Health Matters. This series is produced by Diabetes Africa and sponsored by Eli Lilly and Company, although they have no input into the content of the webinars. Today, we're going to talk about living with diabetes and kidney disease. And this is such an important subject. We've dealt with it to a certain extent, diabetes and kidney disease, in a previous episode. But today is all about the living, how to live healthy, how, as you know, we always do, how to prevent whatever chronic kidney disease you can prevent, how to live your best life if you are having diabetes and also kidney disease. So it may surprise you that we're starting this session with all these celebrities. And you may be asking yourself, why have we put this these photos of celebrities here? Well, the reason why, and you may recognise all or some of them, the reason why is that these are celebrities who have shared with us that with the world that they are either living with diabetes or they're living with chronic kidney disease or perhaps they're living with both and what we wanted to say was this episode is about living with kidney disease and this is something that is worldwide this is something that is increasing in what we call prevalence so more and more people are living with this condition with diabetes or perhaps due to another condition but they're living with this condition and we wanted to highlight to you just a few celebrities who are living either with diabetes and kidney disease or both together and I also want to let people know that we have another episode on kidney disease. So if you want some further information, after you had the wonderful information from Dr. Helena, uh, we've got an episode called Diabetes and Kidney Disease, which you can catch on YouTube. So over to you, Helena. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for a um, kind introduction. Um, thank you and welcome everybody to the session today. I am going to talk to you about diabetes kidney disease. Currently, there are 537 million adults living with diabetes across the globe, and sadly, this number is predicted to rise to 783 million by 2045. Here in the UK, we have 4.9 million people living with the condition. When we talk about chronic kidney disease, it's a common complication of diabetes. It is defined as abnormalities of kidney structure or function which is present for more than three months with implication for health. One in ten adults with, live with some kind of kidney impairment globally. Here in the UK we have about 3.25 million people living with the condition. And the chronic kidney disease, the one in ten adults that are affected, Dr Helena, is that only through diabetes or is it through other conditions? Uh, thanks, John. That's a great question. Uh, we know that diabetes by far contributes to chronic kidney disease, but there are other conditions that will also cause chronic kidney disease, a typical one being hypertension. Uh, so this slide is really to illustrate that uh, chronic kidney disease had many uh, potentially other causes by far diabetes accounts for the large proportion, followed by hypertension and glomerular nephritis. And there are other rare forms of kidney disease as well. And just to clarify, hypertension is high blood pressure, glomerular nephritis is inflammation of the kidneys. Uh, so this slide represents the challenge of chronic kidney disease. It is a major global health problem affecting nearly 850 million people worldwide. But I guess what I would want uh, people on the call to be aware of is, um, you know, the healthcare system is different in different parts of the world. 
So we need to be cautious interpreting this data because surveillance of chronic kidney disease isn't uh, happening across the world. And I think it's a really important point that you draw out there, um, Dr. Helena, because as you say, some healthcare systems throughout the world are not able to recognise people who are living with this uh, condition, with this chronic kidney disease. And we're going to highlight, I know you're, you're really passionate about it as I am, how important it is for us when we do have this surveillance system, when we do have the system to pick it up, that people actually go and get those tests done. Absolutely, Dr. John. I think it's very key that, you know, we you know, we're very fortunate in the UK to have the systems in place. But we I want everyone on the call living with the condition to feel empowered after this session. Uh to really if you haven't had your, your kidney check and which I'll come to, which is both blood test and urine test to have that done um with your diabetes provider or your GP. Okay. I guess the good point to start when we talk about chronic kidney disease is actually understanding what do kidneys do in our body. So kidneys have several important functions. They remove waste product while returning the needed components to the bloodstream. They help us regulate our blood pressure, help us maintain our blood in neutral, non-acidic state, which refers to the pH control function of the kidney. They also balance our electrolyte and fluid levels in our body. They stimulate the red cell production from our bone marrows. So they have really key um, key function in our body. Uh, when kidneys malfunction, harmful toxins and excess fluid build up in our body, eventually leading to kidney failure. So Dr. Helena, so you're saying that they're so important, they're vitally important to keeping us healthy. And when they're not working, all of these things are not happening as they should do. So the waste removal that would normally happen doesn't happen. Blood pressure can be affected. The pH or the acidity of our blood can be affected. The electrolytes or the salts and, and so on that needs to be in our blood and that balance is impacted as well as the hormone production as well. So that that is, you know, they're vitally important, aren't they, for our health? That's right. That's great, John. OK, what we have on this slide is some of the risk factors for kidney disease. Um, the cause of kidney disease can be multifactorial, of course, with some factors relate to genetic makeups and others to social and environmental factors. The most important modifiable risk factors include high blood sugar, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking status uh, or smoking, uh, blood lipid abnormality. And Dr. Helena, can I just clarify for people who may not know that the lipids is the f- otherwise called the fats, the sugar is otherwise called glucose, and um, the HDL and the LDL are the breakdown of the fats or the cholesterol the HDL being the protective part of the cholesterol, the LDL being the one that does the damage. Thanks very much, Dr. Helena. Thank you. So if you're living with diabetes or chronic kidney disease, the way you're going to know if you do have chronic kidney disease is when you go to your healthcare provider, they'll do a blood test and they will ask you to provide a urine sample. And when they get the results back, after it's been analysed, they're going to give you the reports of both of those things, the blood test and the urine sample. Put those two things together and see where you are in terms of stages of this condition. So Dr. Helena is going to tell us more about how that's interpreted and how these figures are uh, put together by your healthcare provider and what they might say to you. So Dr. Helena, can you give us some more information about that? Uh, Dr. John has explained this slide, but just to uh, really reiterate the point. So what we're looking at on the screen is how do we use these two tests to talk about risk and what does that what is that risk? So if you haven't seen this heat map, I'm sure many people on the call will have. I'll orientate you to it. So what you have on the left hand side is the EGFR um, categories G1 to G5. And then here on the top, we have the albuminuria A1 to A3. 
Then the color coding is the green is low risk, yellow is moderate risk, orange is high risk, and red is very high risk. So as you move from left to right or top to bottom, your risk of a poor outcome increases. So it's pretty serious, the implications of the kidneys not working. Um, and as always, what we try to emphasise is what you can do to prevent perhaps getting to this increased risk. So, Dr. Helena, thanks so much for that, telling us about kidney disease, how it develops and how it, the kidneys function and how they can malfunction so we can go on to develop what we call chronic kidney disease. And so now you're going to tell us a little bit more about how we treat or optimise our care when we're living with kidney disease and the various aspects of that. Okay, so this uh, is um, a pyramid that I took from the um, CADIGO guideline, which is uh, Improving Global Health Outcome Guideline for Kidney Disease. And it's really one of my favourite because it's quite comprehensive in a way what it covers. So it starts off with you know, the core stone of managing any long-term condition, really, and specifically here we're looking at diabetes kidney disease. Um, and starting with diet, exercise, you know, obviously smoking is a major risk factor. And if you are smoking and you're thinking about quitting, you know, there are lots of helps out there, both in primary care and secondary care to help you. Uh, so do reach out to your providers and just making sure that, you know, you kind of maintain a good weight uh, as well, just to prevent any uh, any complications, essentially. And, you know, doing this really improves the metabolic markers uh, and reduces your risk. And managing diabetes kidney disease requires the use of medication to control blood pressure and lipid abnormalities, which is the fats in our blood, and glucose levels in addition to lifestyle. Um most pe people with CKD and diabetes should be managed with statin, that's about reducing cardiovascular risk, renin, angiostatin, aldosterone, uh, which is a mouthful, uh, RAS blockade, so short, um, and then uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So additional treatments are also available, which is really about reducing cardiorenal risk, which is heart and the kidney risk in a form of GLP-1 and uh, MRAs or non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor agonists. Uh, medications such as the AC inhibitors and ARBs have been around since the 1980s. However, there's evidence that not all people who should or could receive them based on the national guidelines actually aren't. So it's really to think about if, you, you know, if you've been given information that is abnormality in your kidneys, having that discussion with your healthcare providers, what can I take to prevent worsening of my kidney function? What can I do lifestyle-wise to really uh, reduce that risk? So absence of treatment can lead to faster progression, and I've showed you that in earlier of, uh, in the earlier slides, and it's all about reducing your cardiovascular uh, risks as well as uh, delaying the onset of dialysis and i think that's such a fundamentally important point um that it is about delaying further progression if you've been told that you've got chronic kidney disease and that's not just for your kidneys but that's for your whole cardiovascular system so your heart and your circulation um, and it's vitally important that you discuss this with your healthcare professional because as you said dr helena is the things like the lifestyle measures, particularly smoking. You've got to stop smoking if, if this is a condition for you. And also there are various treatment options that you could be prescribed if you choose to consider these because there is a, a huge benefit from some of the medications that are available. So this is a discussion that you need to have with your healthcare professional. And um, it's because it's about controlling the blood pressure, it's about controlling your blood glucose it's, and your cholesterol, your lipids, to reduce your risk, to keep you healthy. That, that's, that's the thing. So thank you very much. It is a really comprehensive 
diagram. That's right. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Dr. Sarah Afuwape, who's a consultant health psychologist and psychology lead for the Renal Health and Counselling and Liver Psychology Services in, in a hospital in London, to come in now and tell us a bit about kidney replacement therapies, and you may know this as dialysis, for people who are living with either end-stage renal disease or sometimes called end-stage renal failure. So welcome, Dr. Sarah. And thank you for sharing this information with us. I also just want to warn people that Dr. Sarah is going to show us some photographs and tell us about kidney replacement therapies, renal replacement therapies. And it shows photographs of equipment that is used for things like renal replacement and dialysis. So it's just in case anyone may be distressed by seeing these photos, I just want you to be aware that this is what we're going to move into now. So please look away if you feel that you might be distressed. And Dr. Sarah is going to speak with us. And then afterwards, we'll have Dr. Helena talking to us again. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so kidney replacement therapies are um, the treatments that are given when your kidney ha kidneys have failed. And uh, the most common treatment is in, in the UK here is, is hemodialysis. And this is a treatment that's usually given uh, for four hours, three times a, a week, usually on alternate days, either Monday, Wednesday and Friday or Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Um, and it's you, uh, an individual is connected to the machine via um, some needles that go into what we call a fistula. It's just an artery and a vein uh, joined together. And what that does is it takes the blood out of the body and it cleans it. The machine cleans it. It's an artificial kidney. And then it goes back into the body again. And that process um, can take can take uh, four hours or so. That's done either at a hospital or at a what we call a satellite dialysis unit, which is a purpose built uh, building in the community close to home. Or it can be people can be trained up in order to do this in their home um, and they will have a, a machine like this in their home. Another type of uh, kidney replacement therapy something called peritoneal dialysis this doesn't um, clean the blood using um, well this doesn't use um, blood in order to um, to take away the toxins um, but it uses osmosis or diffusion which are ways in which um, fluids and toxins are drawn out of the body and it's usually done um, through the what we call the peritoneal cavity which is a they put a, a catheter a tube in in your abdomen or in your tummy um, and that stays there and you sort of connect yourself to this tube. And it can either be done manually several times a day or it can be done overnight for, for eight hours or so. Uh, and there's an automatic machine uh, machine that sort of sits by the bed uh, and people connect that way. Uh, and, and the other type of kidney replacement therapy and by far the, 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 the treatment that most people want and is offers the best quality of life is a, a kidney transplant. And that's when we take a kidney from somebody else. Um, that somebody else could either be somebody who has passed away, somebody who's died, um, and it's transplanted into the recipient, the person who needs the kidney. And the other two kidneys that you have right at the back here, they're, they're kept, they are, they're not taken out unless, most of the time they're not taken out unless they're, they're causing some problems. And the new kidney is sort of placed sort of at the bottom in, in your groin area. Um, and so you can either have that kidney from somebody who's died or you can have it from a live related a friend or relative who is the same blood group as yourself or uh, and has the same sort of tissue typing. And we also have what we call altruistic donors. And these are very special people who who decide they just want to give a kidney to somebody um, and they, you know, sort of come come to the hospital and say, this is what I'd like to do. And they, under, you know, they, under, they're on, they have to undergo a number of tests. Uh, including uh, psychological tests as well. And thank you very much for that, Dr. Sarah. Now let's go back to Dr. Helena. So, Dr. Helena, was there any other tips that you'd like to leave us with? Um, I always bang on about the urine test because I know, uh, you know, at the population level, we, we're not doing as many urine tests, and that is a key key part of this whole puzzle. So if we haven't got your urine sample, it really we're not having a full picture of your overall health. So the takeaway message from me is that simple one. 
when you have your annual diabetes check, please, please make sure that you have your urine and blood test done. Then from there, I believe my clinician colleagues and all of us in the healthcare can help optimize, um, you know, treatment options alongside lifestyle changes and, you know, introducing exercise and other things to help you live uh, your life to the fullest, really. Dr. Helena, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, you've talked us through that prevalence, as you've said, and emphasised the ways that we can prevent diabetes, kidney disease, and given us information about the management of diabetes, kidney disease, what treatment options there are out there now, so people can have informed conversations with their healthcare professionals. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Dr. Sarah? You're going to talk to us about the psychosocial aspect of kidney disease. And I think we just have to sort of give people um, a heads up uh, that this may be quite triggering to some people. Um, and so we want to say to you that, yes, if, if this is overwhelming um, or if you're finding this difficult, maybe not watch all of it at the same time or come back to it another time um, and we'll try and signpost you to some places that might be of help to you. We've tried to keep it not too in triggering, let me put it that way, um, and we're mindful that it, it could be a, a difficult um, aspect to, to hear about. So, And I know Dr Sarah is very mindful of that um, and she's very concerned that we don't cause you any distress. So thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. We're really looking to hear what you've got to say about the psychosocial impact of kidney disease. So look, before I start, I feel really compelled. I know we've just heard from Helena, but I feel really compelled to highlight the importance of prevention. Um, by the time anybody who has diabetes, who comes to a, a kidney clinic or who sees me, um, we know that something's gone a, a bit amiss with their with their diabetes in terms of its management. So again, I'd like to stress the importance of taking action as early as as practically possible to prevent the need from seeing a, a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor, or from seeing somebody like myself, who's a, a, a health psychologist in in a kidney specialist uh, service. And as he Helene has already pointed out, there are a number of things that potentially sometimes within your control or within one's control that you can do to prevent kidney disease or diabetic kidney disease and that is things like you know we've heard about managing uh, uh, blood uh, sugar levels as well um, and diet and, and exercise is really important as well um, and also other things like you know educating oneself about uh, about kidney disease and, and about diabetes you know coming to webinars like this for example you know you're here now um, and, and that's probably a reason because you're here to learn more about that speaking to health professionals as well speaking to your diabetes team these are all ways in which you can um, become more informed all sounds very easy doesn't it but as I, I you know as a psychologist I'm, I'm very I'm fully aware that not all of these things are easy um, and sometimes they're not always possible to do and living with a long-term condition like you know like kidney disease um, c can be can be difficult um, and you know it, it's it's emotionally difficult it can be physically difficult and draining um, and you know as well as trying to get on with all the other aspects of life uh, that have to happen. So that's why um, support is, you know, is available and, and can be out there. Um, of course, we know that not everything can be prevented and um, for in, in situations where we, we can't prevent uh, kidney disease, then delaying the progression, delaying the progression to end stage is really important. Um, so just a, a, something about um, ethnicity and CKD and end stage kidney disease. I'm sure you're all aware by now, and we're here um, in Diabetes uh, Africa uh, talking about, um, about these things. Um, and you, I'm sure you're all aware that it's much more common in people from black uh, backgrounds, black African, uh, African American, uh, and African Caribbean backgrounds. 
Um, so this is just a slide showing the percentage of US adults aged 18 and over with chronic kidney disease by age, sex and race or ethnicity. This was last year. Um, and as we can see, by far, um, chronic kidney disease affects those who are somewhat older. So there's a large proportion in the, who are over 65. We can see that it affects women more. Um, although men are more likely to reach end-stage kidney disease, or those who are renal replacement or kidney replacement therapies are more likely to be men. And as you can see here, almost a fifth of people from black backgrounds in the US um, uh, experience uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, and these are the, the statistics of last year. So th these are no small numbers. And can I just say, Dr. Sarah, that um, for those of us uh, who may be watching and are over 65, um, that just to point out that this is um, a function of the gradual inefficiency that occurs in different organs in our body as we get older. It doesn't mean that once you reach 65, you will inevitably have chronic kidney disease that progresses to something like end stage um, kidney disease, unfortunately. So just to point out that as we mature, uh, that things get less efficient. And so that uh, heat map, that Dr. Helena had shown us that we're likely to appear on that heat map, but it doesn't mean that it is inevitable progression to end stage kidney disease. It's just a function. It's something that we pick up because as we get older, things get less efficient. Thanks, Dr. Sarah. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. It, it is not an inevitability. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so this next slide, I mean, this is these these are UK data. Um, it, it's very similar here. Um, we can see that um, this is the adult incident rates, and incidents are those who newly start on kidney replacement therapies by ethnicity. And this is these are the data between 2014 and 2020 per million of the population. Um, and we can see that um, ages sort of uh, 50 uh, to 64. Um, if we take up, take the others out of the group, um, is uh, these are very common age groups uh, for people for black people, or people from black groups to experience kidney disease. And again, uh, we can see uh, aged eighty to eighty four as well. There, there's a, a slight peak there. So these are people on kidney replacement therapies. That means dialysis treatment, as I've described earlier, or who have had a transplant, a transplant, a kidney transplant. Uh, this is a quote that's uh, a really helpful quote taken from a, a great diabetes toolkit, which helps health, uh, healthcare professionals to think more about the emotional health of their patients and not just to think about their patients as uh, patients with diabetes, um, but just think more holistically about them. Um, and it states, um, we must go beyond the tendency to place an artificial divide between the emotional and physical aspects of diabetes management that can lead to labelling the emotional aspects of diabetes as a pathological condition. These two are so intertwined and interrelated that simply calling the emotional side of uh, a comorbidity is counterproductive. Basically what that's trying to say is that they're trying to normalise the experience of emotional distress in diabetes. And I've just stuck in um, chronic kidney disease there um, to show that this is very much the case for chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease as well. Um, that people at some stage may feel distressed and we don't necessarily need to, you know, pathologise it or see it as a, as a mental illness. Although we do see people who have psychological difficulties and mental ill health, but that isn't everybody. So this slide um, just shows what we call the, the five stages of grief. And it was outlined by uh, initially by a psychiatrist, uh, Kubler-Ross, um, in a book she wrote in 1969. And it describes sort of the emotional stages experienced um, when um, people are experiencing loss. Um, and it was really around focused in the context of cancer care. But this can also be adapted to any long term or any chronic illness um, <clears throat> uh, and indeed to, um, you know, chronic kidney disease and end stage kidney disease. Uh, I, and I must admit that um, I've encountered people within the consultation who have been through all of those stages um, when they have 
received the diagnosis of, of chronic kidney disease. Um, and as we've said at the beginning, this can be very impactful on their life. Um, and certainly I've seen people at all of those five stages. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're very common and very normal. And I think it's important to, to normalise these stages um, and not to see them as something strange. Um, and I've just outlined what I call the, my emotional pathways here. And these are the different stages of the different uh, parts of a journey of a, of a patient's kidney journey. Again, they may start at seeing their GP um, and, and then when the GP perhaps finds that they've got a blood result that isn't quite right um, and you know they're at stage four or five, then they're sent off to what we call the low clearance clinic here in the UK. Um, and, and in red, I've got the different um, different types of emotions that people may be experiencing at, at these different stages. Um, and from GP, perhaps into the low clearance clinic, people might be in shock. Again, as from our stages of grief, we saw um, denial, bargaining. These are all very common um, experiences and emotions. Um, and they could, individuals can be in the low clearance clinic for several years and they come regularly um, and then their kidney function may decline gradually to a, until a point they'll need dialysis treatment. And sometimes, you know, if it's quite a while, people may become more and more symptomatic. So by the time they start dialysis, they can feel quite relieved, actually, because they just want to feel better. Also, maybe a lot of anxiety, anticipation around the unknown. How will I cope with this? What will this look? How will this fit into my life? And what will this look like? I'm not going to go through all of the stages, but um, to suffice to say, um, I'm thinking about stage three here. We call this an unplanned start. There are people who have absolutely no idea that they have uh, end stage kidney disease because often it's asymptomatic and people can remain asymptomatic all the way until you know they need dialysis treatment. Um, I've just listed here a number of um, factors or the way in which chronic kidney disease and end stage can affect different aspects of one's life. Um, it need not take over um, and with the right support um, people can experience um, a, a good quality of life. Dr Sarah I mean you've given us some really valuable information there about CKD and ethnicity and uh, I shouldn't say CKD chronic kidney disease and ethnicity so uh, now I know that you're a consultant health psychologist um, and you're going to talk to us about the role of the kidney psychologist yes absolutely so so what does the the, the psychologist do and it's not always a psychologist sometimes it's a counsellor Sometimes it's a, a, a psycho, some other, a social worker. Um, but as a psychologist, we'll do what we call biopsychosocial assessment. So anybody who comes to see us, we want to know them not just as the diseased patient, but we, we know that the much more holistically. Uh, we want to understand the interaction of their kidney disease, the biological part of them, uh, in terms of how it makes them feel psychologically, any sort of social or cultural issues. Um, and we want to combine that to better understand uh, and to support that individual. We might do routine transplant assessments. Um, you know, this is really to find out um, how suitable um, people are and whether they're, they're ready for a transplant. Um, often we have uh, psychological or just to be often emotional support. We give people a space when they come to see us just to talk about their feelings, their concerns uh, and the impact of the disease. We do things like psychological interventions. Um, and these are often where there is evidence for um, for these interventions in, in, in kidney disease. Um, but they teach they teach individuals uh, psychological and behavioural strategies and techniques to better manage their symptoms, things like stress, anxiety and depression. Um, we support with behaviour change. So all of the things that Helena was talking about, stopping smoking or, or, or lifestyle changes and diet, and particularly with medication concordance. And by that, we mean getting people to helping people to to take their medicines as prescribed. Um, really important, particularly when people have a transplant. And lastly, things like communication and relationship building. We also support healthcare professionals to become more psychologically aware so that they can start to think about patients not just as, as their disease, but think about them as people uh, with lives um, and, and how what they're going through may affect them psychologically and help them to become more trauma-informed, thinking about what the, that patient may have experienced before they've come into, the, into the, your clinic room. 
So as a psychologist, we help people to think about their thinking um, because we know that the way in which you think about your condition can affect how you feel about your condition, which will then impact how you behave and what you do in terms of keeping yourself well. And it can also affect you physically as well. So we, we can impact all of these areas, um, thoughts, um, uh, behavior. Um, we can uh, help people you know, to attend appointments, um, or to take their medicines, as I said, or physically, with, if the people are feeling particularly stressed, we can help them help them with the physical symptoms of anxiety and the, and of stress. You know, relaxation techniques, etc. So, coping with kidney disease and end stage kidney disease. What does coping look like? It looks like a number of things, including education and awareness. And awareness. Um, this is self education about your own disease. Um, you know, attending appointments, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, um, adhering to treatment plans. Again, as I said, including get, turning up to uh, appointments and to your dialysis session if you're on dialysis. Um, building trusted, supportive networks. You know, find people you can trust within your own space, within your own family or your own network. Or, you know, you can faith groups perhaps or peer supporters. These are people who are in hospital uh, who are part, who are patients who um, you can access, who perhaps have gone through the same thing that you're going through now. Managing stress, really important as well. Things like, as I said, um, techniques, specific techniques, listening to music, whatever works for you in terms of managing your stress. You manage your stress, you manage your blood pressure um, and you feel better. Um, finding a, a specialist psychologist. I mean, like I said, not every service has one. If they have one, if you need the support, do access them. Uh, engaging in things like value-driven activities. Again, these are things that are important to you. What are your values? What's, what's important for you to do? Um, and how can you work and do things that take you closer to your values? Communicating openly. You know, if you go to appointments, uh, whenever you go to your, your appointments, ask questions. Um, don't be afraid of asking questions. That there's no silly, there's no silly question. Um, often healthcare professionals uh, can forget um, because this is what they do. This is their bread and butter. This is the language. Sometimes they use different medical language. Ask the questions uh, and be open um, with family members um, about how you're feeling or whoever that trusted person is in your life. And again, don't forget to congratulate yourself. Set achievable goals. Um, long and short term goals, you know, and celebrate your small wins. You know, if you were struggling to take those medicines, if you were struggling to go to your GP appointment, if you, you know, when you do, well done, congratulate yourself. So th this just sort of, this shows where to go for formal help. Um, as I mentioned, if you have a, a kidney psychology uh, service, then, then do access it. Um, or you can go to your GP and they can refer you to uh, NHS Talking Therapies or it used to be called IAPT. If you, if you have a faith and you have a faith leader, um, they, they may have, you may be able to access faith-based counselling if that's something um, that suits you better. Um, there are mental health charities as well. Um, and if you are able to afford the private sector, then, um, then do seek private therapy or private support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. Really appreciate that. Um, and there is so much useful information there. We know it's quite impactful. It may um, be distressing to some people, but we hope that we provided information and information about the support that you can access as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. It was really good. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant.